Hey family, it's time once again for this week's installment of Digital Disciple. I'm really enjoying our time together as we study the book of Ephesians. Now, I am Pastor Travis and I am so glad you're joining me tonight on this journey. Now do me a favor and drop a comment below and let me know that you are joining us tonight. Alright, now grab your Bibles and a cup of coffee and get to your favorite comfy chair and let's get started. Tonight, we will be studying Ephesians 3, 14 through 4 and 16. Now, Paul's message to the new Ephesian believers in Ephesians 4 is simply this. Grow up. Now, in verse 15, he says, I want you to grow up in every way. Verse 14, I want you no longer to be children of the faith who are just tossed around to and fro on the waves. I want you to be solid. I want you to act like adults. You know, there's nothing worse than adult who still lives like a child. Now, have you ever been around somebody who just refuses to grow up? They expect people to wait on them hand and foot. They have temper tantrums when they don't get their way. Listen, no girl wants to marry a guy who is 35 years old and still lives in his mom's basement and she makes him peanut butter sandwiches and does his laundry all day while he plays World of Warcraft or Halo or some game like that. And the Apostle Paul says, God has so much for you to experience in the world. There's so much that he wants to do through you. So, grow up. So let's take a look at Paul's instruction here in chapter 4. Start with the first verse. He says, I therefore urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. You know the old adage is... Anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, you should always look and see what it's there for. Now, this therefore is the hinge of the bulk of Ephesians. It connects the first three chapters in which Paul has given us one of the clearest explanations anywhere and what it means to know God. To the last three chapters where he explains the difference that knowing God should should make a difference in our behavior. Therefore means in light of what you have just learned about the gospel, in light of what you just learned about God did for you on the cross, this is how you should live in response. And then he goes on for three chapters tell you what that looks like. In verse 4, Paul says that we should walk in a manner worthy of the calling. We should walk in a way that is a worthy response to the gospel. And the way that we do that, he says, the first thing he identifies is by maintaining the unity of the Spirit. And that's verse 4. There's nothing that demonstrates immaturity or unhealthiness more than Christians creating divisions with other Christians. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't Christ die to create a body of believers? And shouldn't we love him enough to do whatever it takes to get along with each other? Giving each other the benefit of the doubt. We should be forgiving one another, putting one another's needs ahead of our own. Now think about your hands. So imagine your two hands got in a war with each other and really tried to start hurting each other. But this one damages that one. This one cuts off. This one's pinky. Who is the one who really loses 
in that whole situation? Well, to put it simply, it's you, right? They are both your hands. See, this is what Jesus feels when Christians in his body can't get along. And they did divide from each other. Now, Paul then moves on from talking about how we should relate to each other to how a mature Christian should be engaged in the world around him or her. He talks about how the Spirit of God is placed in the members of his body, things that we call spiritual gifts, through which God himself works in the world. Now let me use his instruction in these verses to answer the two biggest questions that people usually have about spiritual gifts. Now the first question is, what are spiritual gifts exactly? And how do I know what mine is? Now Paul begins to answer that in verse 7. He said, grace was given to each of us. In verse 12, for the building up of the body of Christ until we attain to the knowledge of of the Son of God. Spiritual gifts are abilities that God gives us to build up others, to help them know God more. Maybe your teaching gifts helps me understand Christ more. And literally, Christ teaches me. He teaches other people through you. Or maybe your gift of mercy helps me feel the compassion of Christ more pointedly. And there are people I know that God has gifted with this gift of mercy in such a way that when they speak comfort to me or they minister to me, I feel that touch of God through them. That maybe you've got a really good strategic mind for how to engage in or lead in the mission. That's called the gift of administration. And maybe God really uses you to reach people on the outside that nobody else is reaching. That's the gift of the evangelist. Maybe you have the gift of faith, and you seem to know what God wants to do in a particular situation. You don't know how you know, but you just know. And so you lead others to ask God and believe Him for that one thing. Now in verse 7, it tells us that every single one of us that are in Christ has one of these gifts. So how do you know what your spiritual gift is? Now, some people seem to like those little spiritual gift multiple choice tests. Have you ever seen one of those or have you ever filled out one of those? It's kind of uh, fill out this paper and then it spits out what your spiritual gift is. Now, I have to admit, I am a little jaded against them because I don't know how you can answer a few standardized questions and it can tell you what your spiritual gifts are. So I'm a little, you know, cynical about it. I think a better way to determine your spiritual gift is to see your spiritual gift as the meeting of three different things in your life. Now the first thing is what you're good at. Let's call that your ability. Now the second thing is what you are passionate about. Let's call that your affinity, what you care about. And then the third thing is what other people affirm about you that God uses you for in their lives. Now let's call that affirmation. And we're going to think of it like a Venn diagram, three circles that intersect in the middle. So you got three circles, ability, affinity, and affirmation. That one little place where they all three come together in the middle, that's going to be the place of your spiritual gift. For me, I have a natural kind of ease with speaking to other people. I'm really passionate about seeing other people grow in the faith and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and encouraging them verbally and to show them how they can do that. 
that other people tell me, they affirm me that when I speak and I teach the Bible, God builds them up in the faith and challenges them. Those three things are an indication that God has given me the gift of exhortation, which is what I'm using. So again, a spiritual gift is a manifestation of God's strength and His Spirit through you and I. And the way that you know you have it, as you look for what you're good at, what you're passionate about, and what other people affirm that God is using you for in their lives. Now here's the second question that people ask about spiritual gifts. Pastor, why is it so crucial that I know what mine is? Now I'm going to give you a couple reasons here. First, because there are certain ways that only you can reveal Christ to others. And certain things that God wants you to do in the world. And if you're not doing those things, they just won't get done. Sometimes you see something not happening in the church and you say, well, why is nobody doing anything about this? And then you go back to your computer and you write your pastor a feisty email. Not that any of this is personal at all to me. But do you ever think that maybe that might be the place where God is called and gifted you to serve? But maybe instead of complaining all the time, you should listen to the Spirit and do something about it. God places unique passions in His people. It doesn't mean that everybody shouldn't care about that thing that you care about. Just that you might have a special burden for that thing. A calling, if you will. I think, for example, of a woman in our church who just has a passion to see unwed mothers reached with the message that God still loves them and He wants to take care of them. Now, we should all care about unwed mothers, of course, but she has a special call and a spiritual gifting. She is using that to lead a ministry. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. Now here's the other reason. It's crucial, crucial for you to figure out what your spiritual gift is because if you don't, you'll never really experience fulfillment in life. Listen, you can't possibly know the will of God for your life if you don't know your spiritual gift. Each of you have something that God has put inside of you. Something he made you specifically for. Do you know what that is? I know that many people in the church feel unfulfilled and they're spiritually bored because they've never had the experience of being powerfully used by God in somebody else's life. They don't know their spiritual gift. They're immature in the faith. Now listen, there is nothing in all the world like the experience of being used by God to really help or minister to somebody. You get the sense when it's happening of that I was made for this. Christ made, God made me for this. Now that's Christ working through you and it's deeply fulfilling as part of the mature Christian life. So let me close with this. Paul says in verse 11, he gave the pastor teachers, people like me, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. God gave pastors and teachers specifically for the equipping of the saints in the work of the ministry. Now let me ask you a question. According to that verse, who exactly does the ministry? Well, the saints. And who were the saints? Ordinary people who are not pastors. Now, my role as a pastor is to be the equipper. The majority of the ministry is supposed to happen through so-called ordinary people who are equipped. 
ministering in the community in the power of the Spirit. I often explain to folks, according to this verse, when I became a pastor, I left the ministry. Because real ministry happens in the community. I work in the church. I equip and raise you up and send you out here to do the work of the ministry. You know, if you count up the miracles in the book of Acts, there are a total of 40 of them. Now, 39 out of the 40 of the miracles happen outside of the church. Now, according to that, where do you think God most often wants to pour out his power? If you ask most people in a church to talk about an experience they've had with the power of God, a lot of times they point to one of the pastor's sermons or a really powerful moment in worship. And yes, thank God for anointed preaching and thank God for spirit-filled worship. But that's not the primary place where God wants to pour out his power. It's through you in the community as you use these spiritual gifts in your community and with those around you and you see God work through you. You see Paul's vision of the church is not a group of people gathered around a charismatic leader. Paul's vision of the church is that it's a factory that is growing up leaders who are operating in the power of the Spirit in whatever sphere of life God has placed you. See, a lot of churches seem to me like huddles. Imagine a football game where you're watching a football team get in a huddle around the quarterback. And the quarterback, he calls the play. Now, after he calls the play, all the players, they stand up and they clap their hands. And they say, man, that was awesome. Nobody calls the play as awesome as you do. And then they all run over and they sit down on the bench. And they wait a few minutes and then they come back. And they huddle around the quarterback and he calls another play. And then this time they are like, man, you gave me chill bumps when you called that play that time. You're the best play caller in America. And then they podcast the play and they video the play throughout the week. And then they go back and they sit down and they just wait for him to call the next play. And at some point you're watching this and you're like, fellas, just run the play. The point is not how well the quarterback calls the play. The point is that you run the play. That is what Paul is saying. Run the play. In other words, Paul is telling us, grow up. Stop complaining about how the church is not meeting all of your needs and become a part of Jesus' ministry force here on earth. So grow up and get off the sidelines. And let's get into the game. You know, one of the great truths about salvation that Paul wants the Ephesians and us to understand is that this great God has put all of his resurrection power into us so that he can bring his salvation and healing to the world through us. All you got to do is make yourself available to be used by him. So here's my question. Have you made yourself available to be used by the Spirit of God in the mission of God in this world. That is it for tonight's installment of Digital Disciple. Once again, I am Pastor Travis, and I am so glad that we got to spend this time together tonight. I'm excited to watch as God is moving us from the ordinary to the extraordinary. So until we see each other again, fam, good night, and God bless. Yeah. <laughs>